So we're actually at the appraisal section. Let's look at this right here. Um, this is actually the national contract price, sales price above appraised value, right? So uh, you can take a look at this number. This light blue line is the actual home price index. And the um, uh, dark blue line is the percent of purchase transactions with the appraised value uh, below the contract price. So 20%, that's a pretty big number. That means people are paying a lot, right? For the properties. We know that. We know that in general. We know that across the United States, and this is a national number. Um, so, you know, sometimes we think uh, we, we get bogged down in, in trying to figure out, you know, down to the $5,000 range for our for our seller. Um, sometimes it, it really doesn't matter in, in, in different markets. We want to be as specific as possible as we possibly can and, and you know, as small of a range as possible. But uh, in, in this market. So price appreciation average, if you haven't seen this number, 15% uh, for the full 2021. Again, this is a national number. Um, obviously, local markets are different. Um, I think we've seen 19% in some pockets in the Atlanta metro, you know, 11%, but, you know, average in there for, for the whole area, uh, whole nation, 15%, which is up from the 2020 full year average of 6%. So tremendous, you know, 9% uh, difference there. We bring up that because one of the things that appraisers look for um, is the trend, right? Like what's happening in the marketplace? What's the trend of the area? What's the trend of pricing in the area? Is it trending up? Is it staying flat? Is it going down? Well, most areas right now, uh, for at least for the past you know, six months to a year and a half, we're going extreme up. Maybe now there's starting to be a slight you know, leveling off. Maybe interest rates are ticking up a little bit. Inventory uh, maybe is coming back in some pockets with some new construction. But again, it's all specific to that area. Uh, there is a chart here uh, that talks about the different types of ways to value a property, right? You've got the appraisal report all the way here, a CMA, um, you know, that we provide for our clients right here. Um, you've got the automated uh, valuation model that we talked about. That's that computer generated. That's the um, the, 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 the Zillow's estimates way down here, it's, it's even further to the right. This one is more of the one you would find on the tax tab in your MLS uh, search criteria. So when you go to matrix and you hit the tax tab, you'll see it says real AVM or price range, like right below it. If you had zero idea of what that home might sell for in today's market and you were just starting your research, you might check that out. And if it says, you know, 500, then at least that gives you a ballpark idea of maybe four to 600, right? Hopefully. Um, but it also has a range there. And then, then you'll start to be able to go dig for your comps. But that might give you a, a place to at least start to think about it. The way that those work, just so you know, is, is, is it's all computer generated, right? There's not someone sitting there just like when our clients tell us, hey, my estimate said this or that. Um, well, the, the, the thing I always like to say, <laughs> to say in regards to that is, uh, well, what if you had gold bars that lined all of your floor? Like that, your, all your flooring were nothing but gold bars, but it says your house is worth, you know, 375,000. Well, obviously your house is worth way more than that if your floor is made out of gold bars. And so that was always my example is how do they know what's inside of your house and what upgrades you've done and all of those type things, like the quality of your house? Well, they don't. It's just a tax you know, how the square footage, let's take a little bit of land, let's take the comparable properties and what they've sold and apply it to that square footage of that property, right? It's a simple mathematic equation. Uh, it, they're not looking at, at the true value. They may happen to be close because a lot of times, you know, it's based on the bed and bath and, and square footage. But if the house is way, way upgraded or way, way not upgraded, you know, Zillow doesn't know that and they're still pricing it right there, you know, like it was either updated like the rest or not updated like the rest. So it's any kind of an easy scenario to point back at somebody if they say, no, this is what it says that we should price it at. That's not it. We're going to use the CMA and then the appraiser is going to be the ultimate one here, right? Which is why they, they are at the, the very beginning of this list. What is an actual appraisal? Uh, uh, an actual appraisal report? It's an opinion of value developed by a licensed appraiser, right? And it's, an, it's supposed to be, and, and it is, an unbiased, independent, objective, impartial, impartial, credible, and reliable opinion of value. So this is the source, regardless of where we come up with our comps, regardless of where the seller thinks it should be priced at. Uh, when the appraiser comes in there, if there is an appraisal being done that's dependent for that contract, this is what takes precedent over all of that. Now, in today's market, we're seeing a lot of appraisal gap coverages, a lot of escalation clauses that might shoot that right out of the moon. And the buyer says, I'm OK paying that difference. Um, and that's kind of a different scenario. It's not 
specifically what we're talking about today. Uh, but you know, you should know that, right? And if you're representing buyers, you probably already know that. Um, but that's what that means. That's the true definition of their appraisal. And again, you've got down here at the bottom, this shows you the most comprehensive value, uh, value definition versus the least uh, comprehensive. So the least is down here with the automated valuation and then a non-appraiser and then us. Uh, and then it jumps up to the to the actual appraiser. All right, if you've ever uh, wondered who orders the appraisal, well, it's the funding institution, right? The mortgage lender um, orders that. And then will the home buyer receive a copy of the appraiser appraisal? And uh, it's it's yes. There's some other information down here that you can read if you want to get in the in the weeds about why and how um, all of that. But of course, yes, they're going to receive a copy of that appraisal. And this is all from uh, NAR uh, information. If you've ever, if you ever go to their site and look at their research stuff, one of the questions we get here is: Is it okay to talk to the appraiser? Does anyone have a, an opinion on that? Yes, it's okay. Is there? Is it okay to meet the appraiser if you're the listing agent? Yes, it's best to. Is there anything that you would give the appraiser while you're there meeting with that appraiser? Yes, a copy of the CMA, <laughs> a thumb drive with a lot of information. And how many offers you got, the range of offers. I love it. I love it. Susan's got a process, I think. I think we, we may need to see her slides on, on that uh, process. <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly right. You know, you can talk to the appraiser. You can uh, meet with the appraiser. And like everyone said on this call, we strongly recommend it if you're the listing agent. Um, and so NAR uh, report says, you know, pre prepare an appraiser's package. And I'll show you. That's one of the downloads we're going to give you today as part of this class. Uh, it, it's actually a, a really um, easy to use document to do this, but um, you know, this one says it can include plats, surveys, deeds, covenants, HOA docs, floor plans, inspection reports, on and on and on, upgrades, remodels, all of that stuff. We'll kind of show you the format we have. You're welcome to do whatever you want to um, with that form and, and expand on it if you want. And then the next thing here, can I speak to the appraiser? You know, yes, right? Um, uh, and then what can be done if the fee appraisal is inaccurate? We'll talk about that. Is the appraiser required to review the purchase contract? Yes, uh, is the answer there. Uh, I think there was one more on here we wanted to highlight. Okay, does a buyer's choice of financing impact the appraisal process? Yes, appraiser must comply with the uh, USPAP uh, appraisal regulations that they have based on the mortgage lender, FHA, USDA, VA. Some loans will require the property to meet certain minimum property requirements. So you and the appraiser, we just we just hit on it. Uh, you know, feel the communication from the appraisal. A lot of times, what will happen is obviously the property is under contract. Appraiser has been notified. It's been scheduled from the funding institution to the appraiser to hey, reach out to the listing agent, schedule the appraisal. Um, you know, let them know you'll let them in the home, right? Because a lot of times they'll ask, oh, is there a lockbox on the property? Can you send me the CBS code to get in that property? Or they have an e key to get in. Um, and you'll just say, yes, what time will you be there? Great. Uh, you know, I'll meet you there. Um, then you're at the appraisal and you're going to give them the um, package uh, that we are going to look at um, to do there and answer any questions. Obviously, the key there is to go to the appraisal. Some tips for you, for your sellers to be able to, uh, you know, let them know how to how to get ready is you want it in show ready condition, right? Um, obviously, the buyer loved it. Uh, the due diligence period is is, is probably done and gone if there were a due diligence period. Now they have an appraisal um, contingency in place, most likely. And so uh, the appraiser doesn't need to walk into a property that does not look like what the MLS pictures look like. Now, it doesn't have to be exactly like that. Maybe for the MLS pictures, everything was off the kitchen countertops, right? Coffee maker, everything. It looked like maybe nobody even lived in there, like a hotel. It doesn't necessarily have to be to that level, um, but you still want to have it clean and good condition. And so this is a conversation you're having with the seller of, you know, we want this in a, in a great, great condition and, and really show ready condition, if at all possible. If there are multiple offers, like Susan said, we're letting them know that we're going to give the appraiser a little space. You know, we're going to be there. Hey, I'm here. If you have any questions, you'll give them the appraisal package um, and then, you know, giving them some space. Not that we need to, to review that, but that's in there. If uh, if it is low, right, if the appraisal can, comes back low, the seller's options are to agree to drop the price if the other side, which they should, send over a, a reduction of sales price a, a, a amendment, um, they can agree, they can negotiate or, or go back on market, right, like agree not to, not to drop the price, and we'll talk about that. 
Um, and then if you did have to do a reconsideration of value, the appraisal came in, um, the other side shared the report with you because it says it's 20 grand below. You see in there that they didn't calculate an extra 300 square feet or some error you know, like that that would have uh, would have had a, a lot of value. Um, you have really one shot. So don't get hasty and call the appraiser and say, I'm sending you over three comps time out, just take a deep breath because you really have one chance to go do that. Um, what you'll want to do is have your ducks in a row, have all of your comps, have all of the information that really is going to prove what was wrong on that on that appraisal. And if it's something easy like square footage, then that's an easy one, right? Here's the tax records. Here's all of the info for that property. But if it's something a little more tricky that you notice on there, maybe they use the comp that um, was really outdated and, and maybe it only had a few pictures on MLS, but you know that property because you talked to your seller about it. That may be something a little more involved that you'll have to actually put you know, on paper to show them why um, the value of that property is actually higher. The uh, appraisal package that we talked about. Well, here's the summary sheet that we're gonna provide for you. You'll be able to go in and type in any of this information. Um, it will all be anywhere that you see specifics on this page will just be a gray box when you get your document. And so that way you'll say appraisal sheet for your property. Um, you'll be able to go in and use this. If you have something you already have that you like, go for it. But this is just here um, if you are starting at zero. And so you'll be able to have this, the details of the property, right? Bed, bath, square footage in the neighborhood, um, how many days on market. These are, keep in mind, anything on here are things you wanna highlight. Uh, number of offers is on here, features and upgrades. Um, you've got some comparables, so the real comparables that, that you really use to help, you know, drive the purchase or the uh, pricing of that property. Um, and the great thing about this sheet is you don't want to put this together based on your information that you found, you know, maybe 20 days ago, if you're in the process of it's under contract, you want to go look again. Let me go check and see what the neighbor just put his house on the market, what it's going for, because if it's higher and, and the market's, you know, trending in that direction, that's going to be a good comp for you to be able to use right before the appraiser comes out, right? So just go back and double check. Hey, is there a great comp that just closed, that just went on the market, that just went under pending, that I can call that agent and see if I can get a roundabout, you know, hey, is it more than list price, less? Did you have 30 offers? Great. I'm going to put that info in here and let the appraiser know. Um, if it can save them some legwork from having to do that and you have that info, then, then you know, that's only going to benefit your seller in the situation. Um, so your information, obviously down there at the bottom, so they can contact you if there's any questions. Um, and then a copy of the contract. I never think it hurts to at least include, you know, a copy of the first page that shows the contract amount. Let's jump into um, the actual appraiser form. This is a, a deep, deep, deep dive into that property and, and submitting that opinion of value that they come out with. So uh, we're going to just hit the highlights of what's in here, a refresher if you've seen it before. Um, if you haven't seen it before, we'll, we'll kind of point out a few things in here that uh, you might want to know um, are in there. This is the first page of where all the info starts to go in. Um, you've got your subject property listed here. They call it a, a, a 1004 or a URAR, uh, um, and that's the appraisal report if you hear it. It is different for F FHA. Um, that's the 1004 FHA. You've got the subject property. So this is the one that we've been working on all day. Um, our property, we want to be able to find those comparable uh, properties. And this is what the appraiser is going to find on this first page. The next one, there's additional lines for more comparable properties, but let's just stick with this one for a second. Uh, and so this is why it's important, right, to do all of that homework that we did earlier, because if nothing else came on market, if nothing else sold, then hopefully our comparables that we had as number one, best one, number two, number three, hopefully those match up. Because if those match up, we have a pretty good idea um, hopefully of where that value is going to land, right? Because we've done our homework, we've helped the seller price it uh, what we believe is appropriately, and, uh, and, and now the appraiser's coming in, um, hopefully, just to verify that, right? That's, that's kind of what we would, would hope would happen in this scenario. You've got down here a lot of different things, right? Uh, you can see all of the, the different categories and things that go into um, this appraisal report, starting with, and, and we're not going to hit all of these, but we're just going to touch on a few of them. You know, you've got the sales price of, of the properties, right? So your subject and then and then the comparables. Um, you have the sales price divided by the gross living area. So there's that price per square foot we kind of looked at when we were looking in the matrix um, situation. 
You've got uh, the sale or financing concessions. So if there were any uh, closing costs paid by the seller, um, was it FHA, where is it conventional? And you can see that in, in, in matrix, you know, when you're going through the property in that bottom right, uh, once the property is, has closed, you'll be able to see that. Uh, the view, uh, you know, so view is on here. The site is on here. Quality of construction, the condition of the actual property. So different than the quality of construction, right? And then you've got above grade room count with the gross living area and finished uh, basement rooms below. And then the garage, you've got a porch, energy heating, uh, functional utility. I mean, things on here that they spend a lot of time uh, to, to go through to be able to get to a point where they're doing a lot of appraisals. And um, this is one of the reasons why, right? Like all of this information here uh, would make my head spin if I had to do this for every listing that we, you know, tried to put in, right? I mean, this is, a, this is a lot of information. We look at it from the marketability, from the big standpoint, like we looked at earlier, they're looking at it just super granular, you know, uh, definitely, you know, splitting hairs when it comes down to this. Does anyone know that technical, you know, appraisal definition of, of how they consider it below grade or above grade? If any wall has soil next to it, it is considered below grade. Yeah, the, the, I think the one of the appraisers said something like, um, "If you can stand on that floor, and if you walk, if you could walk out, like there may not be a door, but if you could walk out and you couldn't walk out flat, you know, of any of those walls that are surrounding that uh, that floor, then it's going to be considered below grade because that means that there's earth, you know, a foot, five feet, ten feet, whatever it is, up on any one of those walls, right, Susan? So." That's exactly what you're talking about. The, the reason that's a big deal and the reason that they, you know, the, the appraisers have it listed here is because they assign different value. You could have a, a basement that on one side of the wall has, you know, five feet of earth, right, uh, of just one wall. And then you could have the main floor. They could look the same. They could be the same quality of construction, um, you know, all the same, um, really everything. If it's a typical home, uh, then they're going to give a lot less value to that basement floor, even if it's finished out the same. Now they're going to give a high level of value because it's finished a high quality versus the comparables, uh, but it's not going to be equal to the main the main floor. Um, the only explanation I've ever heard is that it's more from a utility function. Somebody walks in, you know, main level of a house. Typically, that's where they're going to spend most of their time, and so that's where the value is for that property. Um, and, and so then, if they have to go down the stairs or somewhere else to another floor, or have to go outside to get into that floor, um, that's one of the utility function devalues of of that from uh, the appraiser. So this these are some notes that um, that I had from an, from a, a previous DS Murphy uh, class is that they may call the pen, pending listings, and a lot of times they do, right? So when they're looking at their comps and they see a listing that's pending, um, they'll reach out to the agent. You may have received or fielded a, a call from um, an appraiser saying, hey, I'm an appraiser with this company. I see you had this listing. You know, can you tell me a little bit about it? Or they may come out and, and ask, you know, um, how many contracts you had, you know, was it above or, or whatever pricing and try to get that um, info from you. Uh, this is the statement that they said in that class is, can you convey that it's under contract at or near list price? And so that's kind of the question they lead into to, to that. Um, again, they will start on the same side of the street, like we looked at on our uh, example. Um, and then they'll go to the elementary school, you know, as they get that bigger and bigger zones, um, the elementary school, then middle school, then high school, if they have to go that route. And then the GLA, we looked at on that last uh, sheet, it is the gross living area above grade. Um, and the info from that class, the appraiser said that they do not typically look for um, in the records for permits on the actual basement. Now, that doesn't mean they won't, that doesn't mean it won't come up in a, in a listing that you have, um, but that was some information from them. And then uh, they will do what we looked at. We start at quarter mile, half mile, one mile out of that property. Um, if we have to go outside of, of either that neighborhood or, the, or we're just not starting in a neighborhood um, to begin with. Something that DS Murphy offers. This is really for that, probably a rare circumstance that you'll run across. But if you do all of your homework from what we did in the beginning and say you found one comparable and you went out a mile, you went 12 months back, you did everything you could to try to find a comp for that property, but it was a very unique property, um, you know, something about that property just made it so, so special that there's nothing else that you could find to even compare it to. Um, DS Murphy offers what's called a pre-appraisal. They call it a consultation appraisal. It's 450 bucks. That was the number last I checked. It may be a little bit more than that.
but you can order it um, at their website. It's academyofrealestate.us slash consultation. And what they'll do um, is they'll come out and actually pre-appraise that property before it goes to market, right? The, the best case scenario is you're using it for that unique property. You're using it for something you can't find comps for. You can't really put a price on it. It's a one of a kind type property, um, you know, 25 acres with, with you know, um, three different homes located on it and a moat around it or something, you know, something that you just absolutely couldn't put a value on. I would definitely talk to my seller about, listen, $450 in the realm of things is going to be well worth it. Uh, if we go and, and, and get an actual price from an appraiser, it's confidential to the seller and the rebuttal uh, of this is handled at no charge. And so we'll look at uh, what that looks like. So DS Murphy essentially comes out, writes a pre-appraisal. It looks just like the appraisal. The seller uh, you know, pays for it. It's the seller's appraisal. And so now they have a value. So say that you know, unique property we, we talked about um, comes back at $600,000 for the entire property. That's what's on the appraisal from DS Murphy. You uh, market the property and say um, you market it at $600,000. It goes under contract at 600. And then the appraisal for the buyer comes in at 580. And so you have the pre-appraisal at 600. That's what you listed it at. That's what it was under contract. And the appraisal from the buyer at the end, you know, comes in. And so they'll actually handle uh, that rebuttal at no charge. And they'll essentially talk to that appraisal appraiser uh, about why that property is worth 600 grand. And this is just a little write-up about, you know, what that includes. You can find it on their website. And uh, and yeah, I think that's a, a really good scenario if you if you have that type of property. So we talked at the beginning of class about the Zestimate. You know, Zillow said my house was worth what? Or said your house was worth what? Um, and so this is a comparison. So this is one property. I'm, I'm not going to put the actual address up there, but one property and, and Penny Mac is, a, is an online valuation tool. Obviously Zillow, we know that. There's Redfin's number. So this is the exact same property, okay? And then there's Real AVM. That's the one we were talking about that's in your uh, MLS matrix search, you know, on that tax tab. And so uh, this property was actually listed at 695 and under contract there. But you can see the varying differences here, right? There's a 60K difference between what you would see if you went on this property to real AVM and what this estimate says. Um, I mean, that's a big range. Now, it was listed at 695. In this market, it might go for 750. And that might be the completed price that it happens at. But if you just took a regular market and you just pulled these, these numbers up, uh, this is the one that typically your clients are going to say, well, Zillow says my home is worth this amount, right? And so you can, you, what I would do if I were if I were you and they said that and they were really, you know, hard set on, on that being the number, just pull their property up um, on Google and it, all of these sites will pop up, right? It just, it, it knows, it's like, oh, it's a property. And you click on these like Redfin and, and in your real AVM and show them those and say, well, I know you think it's 750, this site thinks it's 690 or whatever it ends up being, right? And, um, uh, you know, why do you want to go with that one? Just because it's the highest? Well, of course, right? But that's where you as the experienced agent coming in, uh, you know, bringing the actual comparable properties um, for them comes into play, analyzing the pictures um, and, and going through that, uh, that part of it. 